CNN. This is Houston. Please call Endeavor for a voice check. Endeavor, this is CNN. How do you hear me? You're loud and clear, John. How do you hear Endeavor? Great. Good to see all four of you. All right, we'll go ahead and start if that suits you guys. We're ready. Go ahead. The Endeavour astronauts have been in orbit for 14 days now. On Friday, if they land then, they'll have been in orbit longer than any other shuttle crew. Four of the team members joining us from the flight deck, Commander Steve Oswald, Pilot Bill Gregory, and ultraviolet telescope experts John Grunsfeld and Ron Paris. Gentlemen, welcome to CNN International. It's really good to see you. We've been watching your mission very closely from the ground, and we have lots of questions, so let's get to it, starting with Commander Oswald. I'm a student pilot about to take my check ride, and it seems to me the hardest job of this mission is the hardest job I have in a cockpit, landing the thing. Is it going to be any more difficult to land Endeavour after nearly 16 days away from the Earth and your practice trip? Well, I guess we'll find out in a couple of days, John, but um, I think that folks that have uh, flown at, at 15 and 14 days have said that the experience is just about the same as, uh, as landing our shuttle training airplane, or for those that had landed the shuttle before, uh, about the same at the end of uh, as at the end of shorter flights. So I'm not anticipating that there will be any terrible difficulty in landing in 16 days, but uh, we'll find out in a couple of days. Yeah, now you've got this computer thing that you that you practice on called the pilot experiment. Does it help at all? Do you think? Well, I think it does. At least as a uh, refresher, uh, procedurally getting ready for landing. Uh, Bill has been doing that as part of a, uh, a detailed test objective on this flight. Why don't I let you have him say a few words about it? Okay, yeah, Bill. How was it for you? How one of the things we can do with the computer is dial in some different winds that uh, we may encounter and also set ourselves up for different runways. So it gives us a good chance to sit down, get our procedures down, get our cross-check going, just get back in the rhythm of things. Yeah, I got a question for John now. There was lots of talk on the last Astro mission about problems getting the pointing system to find the stars and the other things you were trying to look in on. Is it noticeably better this time than last time? Oh, ab absolutely. We're, uh, in fact, we're observing right now the acquisitions uh, have been going real smooth. It took us a uh, little bit of time to get it going, but by day two or so, we were uh, on the way, and it's been uh, smooth sailing ever since. There was a, a wish list from ground-based astronomers at the beginning of this mission, which included about 600 different targets. How many of those have you been able to get so far? Well, I don't know the exact number at this point. Uh, the, the wish list was not uh, intended to be a list of uh, targets that we were going to get all of. They were. It was sort of a a menu to choose from during the planning of the flight as we went uh, went through the days. Um, I know yesterday, I think it was, um, uh, one of our ground controllers in Huntsville uh, congratulated us on doing our 300th observation. So um, uh, I think we're really uh, taking a big bite out of that list. No kidding. Another question for you, Ron. The astronomy community was pitching NASA um, yesterday and the day before to give you two extra days in orbit, which, as you know, the, the management team turned down. What would you have been able to see that you won't be able to get because you're scheduled to come home on schedule on Friday? Well, I don't know that there's anything that we would be able to see that we can't see now. It's just, um, just a question of getting more targets and uh, taking a bigger bite out of that list. Yeah, do you know, did you tell me a minute ago you think you've captured about 300, you've done about 300 observations? And, and, and tell me about an observation. When you, when you point the telescopes, they're all looking up at this thing in space, whatever it is. Are multiple images captured, or is there a stream of data that's recorded on some kind of tape? Well, there are a variety of things that happen. Uh, first, um, it's kind of a, it's a, finely choreographed sequence of events that uh, starts out with the uh, pilot uh, maneuvering the orbiter so that the payload bay is pointed toward the object that we want to look at. And then um, the mission specialist, John in this case, um, maneuvering the instrument pointing system so that it's pointed uh, very, very close to the object, maybe not exactly right, right on it, but uh, very, very close. And then uh, me taking my turn and, and fine-tuning the pointing a little bit to get the, uh, the exact target down the apertures of the telescopes. 
However, there are three different telescopes mounted out there on the pointing system. One of them uh, built at Johns Hopkins University is a spectrograph. Uh, one, the one from um, the West University of Wisconsin is, uh, is a spectropolarimeter, measures polarization as well. And the ultraviolet imaging telescope from Goddard Space Flight Center um, captures ultraviolet images. Uh, the two spectrographs have a data stream which is transmitted to the ground uh, in real time, so they get a look at the data fairly quickly. Uh, the ultraviolet imaging telescope captures the images on film, and uh, so we've got a lot of very precious film out in the payload bay, which will be processed uh, uh, soon after landing. Yeah, um, how long do you think it's going to take to get that film developed, and which one of the pictures do you personally want to look at first? Well, John, I uh, <laughs> I couldn't tell you that. We've been uh, cranking through observations so fast up here that uh, I'm not not completely sure what all we've observed and what we haven't observed, but uh, it'll be um, a few weeks um, after we land before we get the film processed, and then it takes a while to make duplicates of the flight film so that uh, we don't lose anything and uh, and start examining the images. I want to tell you, as a as a TV reporter, and uh, always wanting instant uh, instant response, instant gratification. The the black and white uh, aiming camera pictures that we see really don't show very much. And, and to try to explain to our viewers around the world that you know there are these great pictures still in the camera that are going to be developed later. You know, we're going to be very excited to look at those things. That's been a problem for us too, John. But uh, but I think it'll be worth the wait. Yeah. Um, now, two of you have children that I know of. Um, I think um, maybe Ron has a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old, and, and I want you to explain to me how you explain your work on this mission to them. Well, um, pretty much the way I've been explaining what we do to you, and uh, they're certainly very excited about, um, about Dad being in space again. And... Uh, uh, they've been, uh, I've talked to them a couple of times while we were up here, and they've asked me how things were going, and, uh, of course, they're going to be very excited to, to see us get home in a couple of days. I got a question, another question for John, um, about looking out at the stars and how that compares to looking down at the Earth from the space shuttle. What's more fun for you? Well, I think, uh, quite honestly, looking at the Earth has been more fun. Uh, the, the view of the stars up here is, is pretty fantastic, and we... At times, we'll dim all the lights in the uh, flight deck here, and uh, we have some uh, intensified binoculars that we use that enhance the image. But uh, the Earth is really a beautiful planet. And, uh, it's a view that's so much different than we have in our everyday life on planet Earth. Uh, the view from space here of the stars is about the same as you get at any uh, mountaintop observatory. So uh, it's really looking at the beautiful Earth. I must say, for those of us back here on the Earth, you sent down some pictures earlier, maybe 12 hours ago, of uh, the Middle East and Africa, the most spectacular pictures of the African continent I have ever seen. I put them on television about 20 times already today and will continue to do so. It's just, what a vantage point. Back to the folks who operate the shuttle for a bit. Bill Gregory, we watched you operate the MACE machine this morning. It looks to me kind of like a Rube Goldberg device with this boot kicking itself in midair. Pretty weird looking. Why are you doing this? How will it help anybody? Well, the uh, MACE is designed to simulate a pointing system at one end of, say, the uh, space station, and then a tracking system at the other. And what you're doing is you're, you're putting in an input at one end, kind of a, a movement, and of course we vary that. And what we're trying to do is stabilize the other end, hold it pointing precisely at an object. And it has a direct application on a uh, future space station, and of course other aircraft as well. Any of you um, scheduled to go uh, up to the Mir space station at some point in your future? I guess as, uh, as astronauts, you, um, um, the two guys who ride up top in this, on this mission, um, would like to go to the Mir if you could and do a docking mission. How, how have you, what's your reaction been to what's been going on the past couple of days with, with Norm Thaggart getting very close to the Mir space station? Well, we're all excited about... Uh about going to Mir and about eventually building uh, the International Space Station Alpha. And uh, and you're right, all pilots uh, enjoy rendezvous flights. I was lucky enough to have one of those on my last flight, and uh, they're certainly enjoyable and very interesting and challenging. 
And as we're moving into this new era of international cooperation, I think that uh, it just makes it that much more exciting. And uh, regarding uh, Dr. Staggert, I was fortunate enough to fly with Norm on my first flight, and uh, I know that he's enjoying himself on his fifth flight and a brand new experience for him, and he's looking forward to his uh, three months on the mirror. Yeah, all right. We've got some questions from uh, young students from the Atlanta area, and they sound better to me than a lot of my questions have so far. How does it make you feel to look down on Earth from orbit? Well, I think that, that it, uh, it gives you a totally different perspective of the Earth than you've had before. And I, I was fortunate enough, and a lot of us have been fortunate enough to travel uh, some in the world. But when you, uh, when you get to go around the world once every 90 minutes, uh, you begin to realize just how small and precious a place it is. And the other thing that grabs you is that when you look at a, at a map of the world, generally they're, uh, they're geopolitical maps, and you see boundaries and borders, and one country's red and another one's blue, and... Uh, you don't see any of that from orbit, and you really realize it brings the point home uh, that we are all one people living on this uh, very special planet and uh, that we need to be taking care of it and getting along with each other. Another question from a youngster, Taylor Hamill. What's it like to be on the shuttle? Listen for Bill Gregory, I think, Bill. While they're handing you the microphone, take a deep breath through your nose and tell me what it smells like. Um, tell me what the atmosphere in there feels like. Is the air dry or wet? Is it too hot or too cold? Uh, actually, it can never be cold enough for me, but, uh, it, you know, we have different personal tastes, so we're constantly adjusting the temperature to make sure everyone's happy. It's a, a dry atmosphere, very similar to the Phoenix area, and uh, actually it smells differently in different portions. Uh, down by the galley, of course, it smells kind of like a kitchen. Up here, it's pretty pristine. It smells like an office or an airplane, but it's... Uh, What's remarkable for me as a first-time flyer is after a couple of days, how absolutely natural the whole experience feels. And uh, you do not feel unnatural at all. It just feels like you're at home after a couple of days, and it is just wonderful. Any of you ever get bored? Hands of anybody who gets bored? No hands. Okay. I don't think I'd be bored if I were sitting there with you. <laughs> One final question, because we're just about Yeah, yeah. Um, is it fun? Is it as fun for the four of you as it looks like it is uh, to, to watch you do what you're doing from the ground? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it, it starts being incredibly fun right at liftoff, and the first eight and a half minutes are just exhilarating, and it, uh, it's going to be fantastic all the way to wheel stop. And it's uh, an experience that we wish that everybody could have, uh, and we're just privileged to be able to, uh, to take part in it. Yeah, we've got another 30 seconds. Anybody else want to, want to comment on the is it fun question before we lose our time? Well, it really is fun, and it's, uh, you know, especially for Ron and myself, it's fun to live a lifetime dream of going to space and also having the privilege of doing our lifetime work here. It's uh, absolutely fantastic. All right, Ron, John, Bill, and Steve, thank the four of you for taking time out of your very busy day. I know we cost you some experiment time because we did our interview at this time of day, but you've really you've provided a lot of insight into what's going on up there, and uh, those of us at the CNN family, thank you very much for it. Well, thanks for coming aboard. We enjoyed talking with you. All right, see you later. That's it, live from the uh, flight deck of the Space Shuttle Endeavor, uh, an interview with the astronauts, uh, four of the seven who were there. They are scheduled to be coming back to Earth on Friday afternoon. We will, of course, have live coverage as we have throughout the mission. John Holloman, CNN reporting. Thank you, CNN.